Okay, thank you. Okay, are, are you seeing my slides right now? Yeah. Okay, great. Good, because I'm, you know, I'm uh, I've given many talks over the years, but this is my first virtual talk. So, so please, uh, yeah. please hang with me a little bit uh, with the, as far as the technology goes. Um, and thanks for the introduction, and thanks everyone for uh, for tuning in. Um, as as Bob said, I've uh, worked at Kodak for for many uh, decades. Retired in 2012, and uh, I have a little consulting firm called ACAP. Um, some people think that stand it, it KAP is my initials, but some people claim that stands for After Kodak, anything's possible. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I've certainly sort of enjoyed my career at Kodak, but also enjoyed. Uh, enjoyed uh, my retirement. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, sort of, I've, I've cut this up into three pieces. The first piece is that um, before COVID, we were planning on giving this presentation at the George Eastman Museum and having a, uh, having a, a tour there. So we're going to give a very quick uh, virtual tour. I'm going to kind of point you to some resources so that you can take the tour uh, kind of at a later time. Um, and then uh, we'll have a break and, and answer questions. Um, then I'll talk about kind of a, a history of some um, important in imaging innovations, uh, including a number of contributions that MIT made that um, were foundational uh, and in, including a, 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 a digital camera that MIT actually um, uh, produced along with uh, Caltech. And then finally, after a break, I'll talk about kind of the main topic, which is the evolution of a dominant design. And by that, I mean, how did digital cameras start from kind of a, a very rudimentary prototype and end up looking like the kind of digital cameras you would, you bought uh, maybe 20 years ago um, that were, uh, that, that kind of replaced, replaced film, if you will. Um, so we're now gonna try to give a little tour uh, of the Eastman mansion. Um, MIT alum may know this as Mr. Smith's house. Uh, some of you may appreciate George Eastman's role. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll get into that in, in another slide or so. So let me, um, it may take me a minute to figure out because I need to switch over to the web browser. Oops. There you go. Here it is. Can can people see the uh, the my web browser at this point? Yes. So this is if you go to Eastman.org, and again you'll have these links later. Um, you can you can click on uh, the 360 degree tour of the historic mansion, and as it loads, it'll it'll bring you to uh, to Mr. Smith's house. And um, we'll see how well we can walk around. Um, this is sort of the main living room. And if you went there on a Sunday, you could hear uh, typically a, a, a musical interlude from a group from the, um, from the Eastman School of Music. Um, and I'll, I won't go too far here, but you can actually, in the... Uh, virtual tour, go to places they won't let you go physically in the house. So any rate, um, at your leisure, if you want to uh, go on your own tour of the Eastman Museum, um, please uh, go to eastman.org and follow this link. Uh, it, it is quite, a, quite an interesting, uh, interesting experience. Okay, it's working perfectly. Is it working good? Okay, yeah. great. And um, the story, which many of you may know, is that uh, George Eastman was um, known as Smith, Mr. Smith um, when he donated the money to build the main campus at MIT. Um, and for about uh, 10 years, he anonymously donated over $20 million to MIT. Uh, he also gave them some suggestions to, to make the main campus all as one large um, uh, combination of buildings rather, and, and build them all at the same time rather than uh, over time. Um, and so he was really fundamental in making MIT um, of what it, what it became. I like this quote um, 
from, uh, from Mr. Eastman. He said, I have a great deal of confidence in the material you are turning out at your institution. So I guess we're, we're good material, at least, at least we were in the, in the day of, uh, of George Eastman. Um, another way you can, another type of tour you can take, um, uh, we just showed you the mansion uh, connected to the George Eastman Museum is a, is a very connected to the, to the George Eastman house where he lived in, is a, it's a large museum that was added in the back. And this has um, uh, some uh, over 300,000 different items, photographs and uh, uh, technology items like cameras and so on. And so there's a virtual tour you can take as well. And, and again, you'll get, you'll get that link um, uh, in, in, in when, when you get the, uh, when the video is posted along with other information. Um, and what I'll try to do now Let's see, I'm, I'm struggling with trying to go on this Google Maps tour. Um, and maybe I'll just, uh, just wait and, and try to do that later. Um, but there is a, this is a large um, two-story area with lots and lots of very interesting um, items in it. Yeah, the, the flash to that, that, uh, that video tour when you first started, just flashed quickly. It just flashed, okay, let me. Let me try one more time here. All right, well, let me, let me move on and maybe during a break we can come back to that. Um, so in addition to those two tours, there's a, there's a video. Um, Todd Gustafson, who's here on the right holding the camera as the technology curator, he's written several books on uh, digital cameras um, and has a really nice one hour guided tour of the technology collections. Um, and in addition, you can uh, search um, over 300,000 objects are online. So if you're looking for a particular um, photographer, a particular type of camera, you can uh, you can easily access them with their search function. And here is um, two examples from their technology collection. So these are physically stored in the uh, in in the large uh, collection we were showing you. On the left is. Wait a minute. We're uh, still. You're still uh, back in the Eastman Museum, at least on my uh, screen. Okay. Sorry. Let me let me stop sharing and re restart again here. Okay. Okay. That's is that better? Is that showing technology collections? Yeah, technology collections examples. Examples. Example. Okay, good. Say sorry about that. Um, so on the left is the first camera sold in the United States. Uh, it's a it's a Daguerre. Um, it's called the Giro Daguerre um, camera. It was um, manufactured in 1939, sold in 1940. They even have the receipt for when it was sold. The, the camera is the thing, the wooden box that with uh, towards the center. Um, but the kit included everything a photographer needed to take a picture. And at that time, the photographer needed to actually sensitize the, the plate um, and then expose the, the plate and the camera and then develop the, um, the plate. So all of that, uh, the camera is small compared to all the, the other uh, equipment that you needed to bring, bring along with it uh, in order to, to take a picture. On the right is uh, a Kodak um, professional DCS camera from 1998. Uh, well, it, it really became the dominant design for professional digital cameras. Uh, and it looks a lot like uh, a professional camera, a DSLR you might you might buy today. We'll talk later about what the dominant design means and and more about how the camera came about. But they just these are two examples uh, of items from the technology collection.
So that was, I wanted to take a quick break. Um, I know this has just been a short period so far, but just wanted to see if there were any questions about the, the Eastman Museum um, or any of the, the things we've talked about so far. Um, the museum is open for tours. You need to go and, and get a ticket. Um, they're in the middle of some construction. So while it's possible to tour it now, it would actually be, I think, a little better to wait another six months till they, uh, till they finish some, they're rebuilding the main entrance. Um, and so it's a little, a little dusty and a little hard to get around there. Okay, I have a quick, I, I, uh, nobody's submitted any questions yet, but I've got a quick one for you, which is, what's your role at the museum? Are you a docent over there? Or what? I know you're doing something for them. I'm not quite I'm, sure. I'm not, a, I'm not a docent. Um, what I've actually done is, um, so during my time at Kodak, I tried to make sure, uh, particularly in my, my last years uh, before the company went bankrupt, we tried to make sure that we could donate to the museum all types of equipment that we made. So all the different digital cameras that we made and, and, and some other um, sort of historic items. And at this point, I'm trying to help them catalog some of the history of digital photography and also trying to make some of these early, uh, early cameras work. So we, we managed to get them uh, an operational Quick Take 100 camera that was uh, more than 25 years old. And the, the issue wasn't the camera, it was actually getting the right computer and the right software with the right interfaces to work with. <laughs> so that's a that's the type of thing I've been uh, been involved with. Okay. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, uh, uh, why don't you just for the sake of, of time uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Give everybody a couple seconds. Okay. Continue on then. Okay. Great. And well, maybe at the end I'll try to show some of the the. Uh, um, the Google Maps and the in the videos that I was having trouble getting to getting to work here, um, but again, you'll you'll get the links for those if you if you'd like to to follow along. So um, I'm going to move on now to um, talk about a number of innovations um, that really impacted uh, the development of digital photography, um, and really digital photography became dominant because it provided a quick way to share photos. In, in 1979, when I did my master's thesis, I was a, a 6A co-op Motor, at Motorola, and I developed a system for wireless transmission of uh, digital images. And, and today, some people are kind of surprised and think, gee, you were, you were working on image transmission you know, back, in, back in the late 1970s. Um, but actually, I was really, uh, I was a latecomer. Um, more than 150 years ago, the first images were transmitted over uh, telegraph lines. So literally before the first phone call was made, uh, just a few years after telegraphs um, were, were available, there was a commercial system um, that allowed you to, to transmit images. And the way this worked is that, um, you know, we couldn't take a picture, you had to actually draw the image on a tin plate using an insulating ink. And then there was a pendulum in the transmitter um, that moved back and forth and it converted that two-dimensional um, image into an electrical signal. And the signal was transmitted over the telephone line. And then when it got to the receiver, uh, electric current in the stylus uh, darkened the paper. The paper had been treated um, with potassium ferrocyanide and it got darkened um, when the electric current went through it. So um, image transmission has been around for over 150 years. Now that was all mechanical scanning, but we'll talk about electronic scanning uh, in, in, in a few minutes. But the, the next thing that uh, really came about that uh, I wanna focus on is, is George Eastman. Um, before Eastman's time, a photographer was a professional. They typically coated their own glass plate, took the picture and developed it uh, in a dark room. And Eastman had the idea of uh, making photography simple enough for the masses. Uh, and he realized that one of the things he had to do was replace that glass plate, which had to be pulled out of the camera every time you took another picture with flexible film. And um, so making flexible film was, was a key and he, he invested in um, making that film using roll coating equipment. And actually the, the person who designed the first roll coater for 
George Eastman was an MIT graduate um, from, uh, from 1890, uh, but he was able to make that film in, in um, high volumes. He also built very simple cameras, and the key was, uh, to him was to build it with standardized parts. And so before, a couple of decades before Ford um, started building uh, cars with standardized parts, uh, George Eastman was doing that with cameras. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, he realized you need a complete ecosystem that um, you need, to, and he put in place photo finishing um, services around, really around the world, so that you could push the button on the camera, Kodak would develop the film and, and provide your prints. There's a great biography, um, and again, we'll give you a link to, a, to this, about uh, George Eastman um, by Elizabeth Breyer, um, who's associated with the Eastman Museum. Now, digital photography is rooted both in conventional photography and in video. And probably the, the most important, important person uh, there was uh, Philo Farnsworth, who is often, or probably should be known as the father of television. And there's a great book called The Last Lone Inventor uh, by Schwartz written about, about uh, Farnsworth. Um, he pretty much by himself, with the help of only a, a few technicians, um, developed the idea of electronic scanning um, by um, deflecting magnetically an electron beam. So in the, in the camera, there was what he called an image dissector tube. Uh, it was coated with a photoconductor. When the light through the lens hit it, that would absorb light and emit electrons and the electron beam would be deflected. Um, and the beam current um, needed was, uh, was, was the image signal that was then transmitted over the air. And at the receiver, there was another cathode ray tube, this one coated with a phosphor that was synchronized um, and the beam would deflect and the beam current would cause the phosphor to emit light. So Farnsworth basically built all of that um, himself with a, with a little help in his garage in 1928. And that's really the, the, um, the way uh, television came about. Um, the next person I should talk about uh, may be familiar uh, to a number of you, it's Doc Edgerton. Um, he developed the, the strobe flash, which is still used today in uh, digital cameras. Um, and there's a great uh, video um, that, about a five minute video that, that uh, shows his work and his laboratory. Um, you, may, you may be recalling uh, walking down Strobe Alley during your days at, uh, at MIT, and you could see some wonderful pictures as well as some great demonstrations. Um, the way, uh, the, the way the strobe works is you have a glass uh, tube that's filled with uh, xenon gas, a uh, battery charges a capacitor, and when you trigger, you push the button on the camera, that triggers uh, the gas to be excited and the energy in the capacitor quickly discharges to make a very bright flash of light. And of course, uh, Edgerton is probably known as much for some of the pictures he took. Uh, the picture here, uh, Milk Drop Coronet, uh, has been uh, called by Time Magazine one of the top photos ever taken. Um, and so again, if you go to their website, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll learn more about that. About the same time uh, as Edgerton was working on, uh, on strobe flash, um, MIT professor Claude Shannon was laying the foundation for digital information. First of all, he did his master's thesis in 1937 on applying Boolean algebra to digital circuits. And this has become really the basis for modern circuit designs. Uh, if you're trying to optimize the design of a processor, um, he really showed um, how, how, how to do that. Um, more importantly, even in, uh, in the later 40s while working at Bell Labs, he, um, wrote a paper on the mathematical theory of communication. And so this describes how information, which includes images, can be treated as bits and how you can um, transmit those bits and, and really what the limits are to transmitting those bits over a noisy channel. Um, so today those ideas that Shannon had are applied in digital photography from everything from how the image processors are designed to how images are compressed and, and transmitted. Um, Amazon Prime Video just came out with a nice 
hour and a half long show called The Bit Player that describes uh, Shannon's um, um, career. And he was quite an interesting guy in addition to all the technical he, work he did. He, uh, he loved building gadgets. He built everything from a mouse that would learn to follow a maze um, back, I think this was in the early 50s, uh, to he, he, for his son who played the trumpet, he, uh, he uh, modified it so that it would actually shoot flames out um, on occasion. So quite, quite the interesting guy. And then the last professor I'll talk about is uh, Professor Bill Schreiber. Um, he was my thesis advisor. And in the, in the early 1970s, he designed a system that is used by the Associated Press to share um, photographs with newspapers around the world. So it used, uh, you can see him uh, with, uh, this is some, actually some laser scanning part of the equipment. Uh, lasers would scan the photographic uh, prints and they would be um, digitized and then uh, transmitted. And at the other end, they would be printed using lasers. And this system was part of what AP called the electronic darkroom. So the pictures were stored in computers, edited, the editors could decide which ones to transmit. And this is one of the, really one of the first applications of using uh, computers to uh, process and, and transmit and edit digital images. Now those images were all originally captured on um, photographic film, but of course, digital cameras use solid state sensors and solid state sensors were, were invented at Bell Labs in the late 60s. Um, they were first commercialized by Fairchild in 1973. You can see the picture of the first uh, monochrome video camera Fairchild sold, which had 100 by 100 pixel innerline CCD, very large pixels, 40 by 30 microns. Today, pixels are on the order of a micron or so uh, squared. Um, the way CCD sensors, and, and at the bottom left you see the data sheet um, that shows some of the array. The way a CCD sensor works is that the light from the lens, the photons are absorbed by the silicon and they generate electron hole pairs and the electrons are collected into charge packets in what are called potential wells. So the little white squares, each of those is, is one of the uh, photocytes. And then the image is, is read out using what's called charge coupling. Um, the lines are shifted up to the um, horizontal readout register um, one line at a time and then transferred to the right to an output uh, amplifier where they're converted into a, into a voltage. So that's how a CCD image sensor works. Now, a CCD um, sees in black and white. And um, in order to make a color image, at the time, you'd use this prism beam splitter and three CCD uh, sensors, which, which is, was large and expensive. Um, Kodak's probably top contribution to digital photography was made by these two gentlemen, Peter Dillon and Al Bro. Um, in 1974, Peter was working uh, in Kodak research labs on a, they'd started work on a, on a, a consumer camcorder and they wanted it to be in color uh, and Peter came up with the idea of integral color sensors. And in, in, in this case, you have the color filler, filter pattern and each of those photo sites is overlaid with red or green or blue so that one sensor can, can capture an image in color. And then in addition, you need special signal processing in order to separate out those colors and make, make a best color image. So on the bottom right is the, the first camera head they developed with the world's first color um, image sensor, which is in the um, National Inventors Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, today, this technology is used almost anywhere you capture a color image. So in your smartphone camera, there's one of these in the front-facing camera, one in the rear-facing camera. They're used in digital cameras. They're used in the webcam uh, I'm using right now. They're used to, um, to, to film most Hollywood movies, which is why Peter and Al received an Emmy Award in 2019 and used in backup cameras. So this is a, a, a probably the most significant digital photography invention that's, that's come out of uh, Rochester. Now the actual pattern that is used um, is almost always what's called the buyer pattern. On the upper right is Bryce Beyer. Um, 
And on the left is a, a page from his notebook that I was fortunate to find that shows a pattern um, which has uh, a green checkerboard and then lines of red and blue pixels. And this is used almost exclusively today on color sensors. Almost every smartphone uses this. And you can see on the bottom right, the data from the color sensor, um, those would be the, the values for red and green and blue. And then there's processing that creates this uh, processed color image that kind of fills in. So you have a red, green, and blue value everywhere. This happens to be the, the close-up of uh, someone's eye. You can see the glint in their, in their eye. So um, during my early years at Kodak, during the 80s and early 90s, I did a lot of work on um, developing the digital algorithms that would process those kind of color images. So you'd start with a color sensor that's got uh, the overlay, um, turn it into digital data, and then you'd demosaic it as it's called. So you'd end up with a, a red and green and a blue pixel at each point. Um, then you do white balance to compensate for the illuminant with the pictures taken indoors or, or outside under daylight. Do some color correction for the spectral sensitivities of the, of, the, uh, of the color sensor. Do some sharpening edge enhancement to compensate for the lens. And finally, typically in a digital camera, you do JPEG compression. So this is the type of processing um, that's used today in um, most color imaging systems. So with that, I wanted to pause again for questions uh, and again, see if there are any have been submitted, Bob, or people want to okay. provide one verbally. Nothing's been submitted, at least, yeah, no, nothing's been submitted. So if anybody has questions, uh, unmute and uh, ask now. Don't be shy. Nobody can see you, come on. No. I, I could uh, ask a quick question. Um, yeah. This is, Laurel. let's see, Laurel on my video I guess it's polite <laughs> I, I'm I'm not quite clear how the RGB how that single sensor um, can front piece camera that you showed actually does the trick can you could you explain it just a bit more to us sure sure so in a in a black and white camera you have um, photo detectors little photo diodes typically nowadays and they're all sensitive to light. So if you had, um, in this case, you have 100 by 100 pixels, so 10,000, they're all sensitive to, they're basically like black and white film. And what you do is you put a, a red filter over some of those and a green filter over others and a blue filter over others. And you do it in this ratio um, because green is um, um, luminant, Luminant, your eye is more uh, spatially sensitive to luminance and green is 60% luminance. You put more green um, photo elements than red or blue. So basically in different parts of the image, you're sensing um, red and another's green and then another's blue. And so, uh, and, and you can, you can kind of see that with this data from the color sensor I'm showing here, you know, at any one spot, you're only seeing one of red or green or blue, but the picture is very highly correlated. Uh, and mm. so therefore you can use the neighboring greens to what's called interpolate a value for where a red pixel might be. And then having done that um, and knowing the ratio of red to green, you can interpolate that, interpolate that ratio of red to green in in uh, across areas where you don't have red and so essentially you're you're spatially sampling you know one one location is only sampling one color and then you're doing digital processing to sort of fill it in okay. i see that that helps so so it's basically just closely spaced filters um, exactly yeah and of course with 100 by 100 um grid you're going to be able to see a lot of artifacts when you get up to many megapixels um, you, you, you don't see the artifacts and part of, there's some optical pre-filtering and some, a lot of processing to try to eliminate artifacts. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. I've got another quick one, which is how fast does the processor, and, and today's cameras, how fast does the processor have to be in order to uh, uh, process all this pixel information and uh, get the picture taken in what, a uh, couple of milliseconds? 
How fast is the processor? Are they gigahertz processors or are they uh, megahertz enough? Well, in, in a digital camera, um, what the way this problem is typically solved was to buffer images, read them into the buffer, and then you had some time to process them. So you might have a buffer that would store 20 images. You could take a burst of images and then, uh, and then process them. So you don't really need um, the, the highest speed um, processors. When you're, when you're, when you're uh, dealing with video, and particularly HD video, uh, then you do, and that's, that's really where you, you have to go to extremely high speed processors. Now, when we'll talk at the end about uh, smartphones, and of course they have some pretty powerful processors in them for other purposes, um, but what tends to happen with the, in, in smartphones and even in digital cameras 20 years ago, was if you had processing like the, the, the processing I showed in, in, in this um, kind of so-called image processing chain, you would put in a special piece of hardware that was sort of optimized um, to do this rather than just using a general purpose um, you know, processor to, to do it all. Okay. And over the years, I've developed a number of special integrated circuits that would, that would do this type of processing during, during my time at Kodak. Yeah, uh, Ken, hi, this is Dave Ordman. I have a related question. Um, I'm just wondering how deeply integrated these separate uh, image processing functions are in terms of a single chip versus a single purpose chips. You, you mentioned the JPEG compression, the demosaicing, the sharpening. Um, you know, how many separate chips are we talking about, or are these deeply integrated into uh, into you know one or two chips that do it all? Well. So the, the answer really is it depends on the time frame. In the, in the late 80s, we developed a, a three chip set, a set of digital processors that would do pretty much what you see here. Um, and, uh, you know, that was at the time when, you know, a custom integrated circuit, you know, was, a, you know, was um, hundreds of thousands of transistors or so, uh, maybe a million transistors. Today, you could do all of this on a very small part of the processor that's in a smartphone. So, you know, the answer is, yeah, once upon a time, it was a lot of chips. And even though the resolution today is, is you know, there's a lot more uh, megapixels rather than, you know, a fraction of a megapixel back uh, 30 years ago, um, you know, Moore's law has made it so that it's possible to do this processing very, very uh, inexpensively on a very small part of the processor that's in a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, continue on. Okay, so let, let me go on and talk about kind of the, the, the third part of the talk, which is um, what I call the evolution of a dominant design or a winning the marketplace. And um, you'll learn that, that um, many different companies and engineers at many different companies um, contributed to what uh, became the dominant design in uh, in mass market digital cameras. So first of all, what what's a dominant design? Um, and this is sort of a short version. Um, it could be a a long business school topic, but basically, you know, the first design of something is often not the best design, and the design evolves until it it wins the marketplace. So on the on the left is the first two-wheel bike, I'd say it's a bike, and on the right is the dominant design, kind of the bike you see today. So a bike was invented by uh, Baron von Dreis, I guess, in uh, 1817, and it looks kind of like a bike, but it was missing a few things. It didn't have any pedals or brakes. You had to push, push along with your feet to start and stop. It had a wooden frame, a fixed seat. So um, about 50 years later, someone added wheels to the to the front pedal so now you didn't have to push you could pedal uh, and then in the 70s somebody uh somebody else decided that gee if i make the the wheel in front a lot bigger i can go faster um, at, the, at the risk of safety if you, you fall off obviously <laughs> um, but it took a while uh it took another couple of decades before there uh, th they started developing bikes where you had uh Equal size wheels where the pedals drove the 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 uh, rear um, 
the rear wheel with a chain where you had a derailleur and front and rear brakes and lightweight metals and all. So there were a lot of different inventors who actually invented the bike. Um, because when you think about the bike today, you think about not the thing on the left, but the thing on the right. And that was, um, that was really the work of, of a lot of uh, different people. And it's similar with, uh, with digital cameras. Um, this is my, uh, my friend and Kodak colleague, Steve Sasson on the right. Um, and he's holding um, a camera he built um, that was the first handheld digital still camera. I was, uh, I was graduating high school and starting at MIT um, when, when Steve was working on this camera. Um, it used, we talked about that Fairchild sensor, 100 by 100 pixels, that's what this one used. It was monochrome only, no color. It had 16 AA batteries, which is what you needed in order to make it portable and not have to plug it in the wall. It used the, the zoom lens and viewfinder from a movie camera and a, a 4-bit A to D converter and 6K bytes of RAM. Um, and it stored images on magnetic tape. You can maybe see a cassette on the uh, kind of what the facing you, the right side of the camera. And it would, it would read images out of the sensor, A to D convert them, and then take 20 seconds to record an image onto tape. Uh, and then there was a special playback unit at the bottom that um, you put the tape into and it would show it on television. So this is the first digital camera built at Kodak. It's a little different from the cameras that were, were commercialized later. Um, and interestingly, you know, several years earlier, um, Dr. McCord at MIT and Dr. Westfault at Caltech developed a system that um, they um, used with a telescope. And this had an image sensor that's actually 256 by 256 silicon diode array. So it's a, a, a higher resolution sensor. It was cooled with dry ice um, and you'd read out the signal, A to D converted, buffer it and store it on magnetic tape. So they published in, uh, in March of 1972 um, an interesting paper. And, and this is, these diagrams are from that paper along with a, a digital image of Jupiter. It looks a little different than a, your typical digital image, but it's sort of showing you the code values for how bright different, different portions of Jupiter are. So this was um, you know, three or four years before the work that was done at, uh, work was done at Kodak. Um, there's an even earlier patent on a digital camera. Um, and this one takes images underwater. Um, it has an acoustic, an array of acoustic sensors, and so it can take pictures of something like a submarine. So you see on the right is sort of a, a, a sonar of the submarine. Um, so, and, and this is a digital camera because the patent they filed was actually called digital camera in, uh, filed in 1971. So, so, you know, who invented the digital camera kind of depends on what you mean by digital camera. You know, is it a portable thing that you walk around with that replaced your um, you know, 35 millimeter film camera, or is it something that takes digital images of submarines or stars or whatever? But what, what is clear is kind of who made the first filmless camera. In, in 1981, Sony demonstrated this Mavica camera, which is on the lower, lower right here. And this would take, um, analog images. It wasn't digital. It used analog recording, similar to a, to a videotape recorder of the era. Um, and uh, they made four prototypes in um, 1981. Um, and that led to the standardization of what was called the still video floppy standard. Um, and, and quite a few uh, different companies, including Canon, made um, products in the late 80s. But this uh, was really a failure as a product class. It was very expensive. Uh, very poor sales and sort of was replaced by by true digital cameras. In the in the 1980s, of course, Sony was famous for making televisions, and so their system was all based on TV standards. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, it was similar in quality to videotape. You had different uh, standard for the disc in Europe and the U.S. because you had different television standards, and you needed special hardware if you wanted to print the images or transmit them. Um, so the first, you know, electronic cameras were actually very close to, to video, but uh, they, were, they were not successful. Now at the time um, at, at Kodak, 
um, we really focused on digital photography and moreover on using the computer as the center of digital photography rather than rather than video. Um, and this is because sort of in the late 80s and early 90s, computers uh, were starting to become capable of handling images, not just text. Um, and you know, it was clear that computers could store and copy and edit and share digital pictures. And the, the nice thing about when the image is digital, you're not fixed to any one particular resolution. So the digital photos can be different sizes or quality levels, and you can have worldwide standards. So that was, that was really what we focused on at Kodak. Um, in 1986, um, our research labs fabricated the first megapixel color sensor. And uh, John said, my group uh, basically was charged with trying to make the best pictures uh, using that sensor. John Salzgiver, um, one of the group members, is shown with this megapixel camera. So you can see it doesn't look much like a camera. It's really, it's built on an optical table, but the, the whole point was to try to see what we could do to get the best pictures. Uh, so we developed methods to try to improve um, things like the sharpness, the sensitivity, the color reproduction. Moreover, we compared those to prints from photographic film um, because obviously Kodak was very, very interested in knowing how does this solid state technology compare to, to kind of the bread and butter film technology at Kodak. And, and we showed that if you had a well-designed camera with about four megapixels and the right kind of image processing, you could make prints that would be comparable to film for most scenes up to up to say an eight by 10. Um, but it took more than 15 years before that type of camera was really available to the market at a, at a price point that made sense for consumers. Um, but we had done, done work in the, in the late eighties to really uh, kind of compare and show and contrast and develop metrics for, for comparing them. Now, you know, the, the, the issue was, of course, it was until really the 2000s before the technology was inexpensive enough for consumers, but professionals were willing to pay much more for, um, for digital cameras. And um, this is a picture of Jim McGarvey, who, who's really the father of the DSLR, kind of one of the, the, probably the best engineer I ever met at Kodak. He designed the world's first uh, DSLR camera sold in 87 to a all he can say is it's a government customer. And since I'm not cleared, I didn't know who the customer was. Um, but then over the years, Kodak adopted that technology for professional cameras starting in uh, 1991. And really we were the market leader in DSLR cameras until 2000. We, we used uh, Canon or Nikon uh, film camera bodies because they had the high quality lenses that were needed. Um, but, but Kodak uh, manufactured these cameras in, in Rochester and really kind of, you know, developed the dominant design uh, during, the, during the 1990s. Now, there are many other companies that contributed to um, the development of consumer digital cameras. Um, here's, here's a couple of uh, uh, cameras. The top one was from Fujifilm in 1988. This was the first camera that used a memory card. It cost several thousand dollars for the camera. And the card, um, two megabyte card could store um, five VGA resolution images and it had battery backup. So um, you had to pull the card out and transfer the images within 24 hours or you'd lose them. Um, the, the bottom camera was made by a company called Dicam, little garage shop. And they had a camera, the first camera for under a thousand dollars, but it was monochrome only. Uh, and again, uh, use DRAM internal storage. Um, so uh, the, the images didn't last long if you uh, didn't get them to a computer. In, um, in 1994, Apple uh, introduced a camera that uh, the Time Magazine calls the world's first consumer digital camera. So you may or may not believe it. It was also named one of the tw top 20 gadgets of the last 20 years by the Wall Street Journal. Um, it had a list price of uh, just under, oh, I guess, $749, um, designed by uh, uh, my group in Rochester, did the, the detailed uh, architecture and, and the electronics design and image processing. Apple did the, made the, the case and of course sold the camera. The Mac actually performed the image processing. So today this would be 
called a camera that stored raw compressed images um, and was transferred to the to the camera. Um, but um, at the time, this became the world's most popular camera. Um, and this is a the picture of me was actually taken at the uh, by the George Eastman Museum um, for an exhibit they did a few years ago. So I can I can say that I was hung by the George Eastman Museum. <laughs> now that lasted about a year. And uh, then Casio came out with uh, the QV10, which was the first camera that had a LCD display screen. Um, and the pictures were actually lower quality, but the display was key. People really loved the fact that you could take a picture and instantly see the photo uh, and, and, and show it to, to, to people. And this then became the world's most popular camera. And ever since, um, digital cameras have, have had an image display on them. Um, but uh, this had internal memory, and it was very hard to get the images out of the computer over, uh, over the RS-232 interface. Um, and what happened is uh, two years later, Sony came out with uh, a, what they called the digital Mavica camera. Um, I've got one of these. See if this, is, this was a Mavica camera, and it stored images on this thing. A floppy disk and everybody knew how to take one of these out of the camera and put it into the computer um, so it's using standard floppy disks they're inexpensive um, the resolution was was VGA 480 by 640 uh, but this made it really easy to get your images into the computer and then this became the number one selling digital camera now of course over time memory cards uh, were being developed. Actually, quite a few different companies were developing competing uh, memory card uh, formats. Uh, there, were, um, there was a PCMCA or PC card uh, type, and this was used in professional cameras because uh, the green line shows the cost per megabyte over time of hard drives. And since professional cameras stored a lot of raw images, you needed a lot of memory. So they were used throughout the 90s and early 2000 in professional cameras. Consumer cameras used flash cards. Um, and you can see how the, the price dropped. In the, in the Quick Take 100, we had uh, one megabyte of flash memory, which cost Kodak $40. By 2002, that was down to $1. Um, so you can see how, 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 uh, how much the, the memory has decreased. If you took the, the memory in your um, smartphone today, Back in 1994, it was probably over a million dollars just for the memory. Um, and in addition to the, 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 the memory card, which took a long time before um, uh, cards kind of settled in on compact flash and then SD and micro SD, uh, it turned out that the more important thing was the actual image format you used to store the images. So because the flash memory was expensive, you needed to do compression JPEG compression was developed, standardized in the early 90s. Um, and it's still used you know, uh, today, almost 30 years later. Um, and as part of the JPEG format, there's room at the beginning of the file to store metadata. And so we, we developed what's called EXIF metadata, which can store things like the date and time the picture was taken, the camera settings, and GPS where the images were taken. So this of JPEG format is, is still used today in, in smartphone uh, cameras. And then finally, there's uh, the file structure, DCM, DCIM, which uh, uh, specifies where, okay, where you actually, how you name the files and how you store them into directories. So in um, late 1997, um, Kodak really combined the best of these different technologies we've uh, been talking about um, to develop the first consumer megapixel camera, cost about $900. And this displaced the uh, Sony floppy disk camera as the uh, top selling consumer digital camera in 1998. Um, it had a really nice LCD display with a nice user interface, used the compact flash card with the EXIF JPEG format. It would let you display um, photos on, on television. Um, now the downside, of course, of being the dominant design is that means you're successful. And so within a year, pretty much every other company had a similarly featured megapixel camera. Um, 
the um, the the DC 210 family still had some drawbacks. It was frankly it was a little tough unless you used a card reader to get the images out of the camera over the slow RS-232 interface or the slow uh, and not very widely supported um, infrared interface. And uh, so in 2001, um, Kodak introduced uh, EasyShare cam uh, family of cameras. By this time, most computers supported the universal serial bus, which was a much higher speed interface. And we made a dock to get it, uh, get the um, pictures out of your camera and into your computer. So you'd, you'd literally take pictures, put it in the dock, press the button, and that would drive the um, system software to transfer the images, share, store them in the right folders, and make it possible to share them or upload them online while it recharged the camera batteries. And we also made, uh, a few years later, we introduced um, dock printers that made uh, up to four by six snapshot uh, printers, and those became the most popular snapshot um, printers. And so by 2003, Kodak had regained number one market share in the United States and was doing very well in the, with these snapshot printers. Um, in 2005, we got a new CEO who decided to focus on inkjet and sold off most of the digital camera assets. And, and basically, we, we slowly um, devolved out of uh, digital cameras. Um, although in any case, the digital cameras didn't really remain the dominant design um, for mass market photography for very long. Um, as you probably all know, um, given the smartphone cameras you're probably carrying around in your, your pocket and, and purse. So just the last couple slides, I'll talk a little bit about uh, mobile phone history. Um, cellular phones were first demonstrated in the 70s and commercialized in the early 80s. Uh, the first digital systems uh, came out in the uh, in the 1990s. On the left is Marty Cooper from Motorola with a first mobile phone. Um, I always he, you, you may have seen him on television as the inventor of the of the uh, mobile phone. And I realized I actually have his autograph because I was a co-op at Motorola and working in his division. So he signed my thesis on the front page on behalf of Motorola. Um, the uh, the second thing which is uh, on the frame is the uh, Nokia 9000, which is really the world's first smartphone. Uh, and come, it came out in 1996. It lets you run apps and surf the web and send texts and emails. Uh, but you'll notice there's no camera, there's no touch screen. And clearly this is not uh, the dominant design for smartphones today. So it took um, more than 10 years to evolve from this to what became the dominant design. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, camera phones. There's some question about who developed the first camera phone and various people have taken credit for it. Someone uh, from 1997 claims to be the inventor of the camera phone. And that's not, I know that's not correct because at Kodak, I'm along with a couple other inventors have my name on some camera phone patents from 1995. Um, but actually in 1994, uh, there was a very interesting project at Lund University in Sweden. Um, and what they did was they took a, uh, a um, touchscreen PDA made by Sharp and they kind of glued a CCD camera onto the back of it. And then they cabled it to the shoulder box that has a modem and a cellular phone and a GPS. And um, the users would walk around and take pictures and those images were um, uploaded to a central database, which tracked the user location, and the person at that uh, central server uh, could communicate back and forth with the users. Now, the interesting aspect about this is that this wasn't built by someone wanting to commercialize um, a smartphone. This was built by a group that was trying to help people with cognitive disabilities. And so by taking pictures and sharing the pictures, uh, it was more easy, it was easier for them to communicate. Um, but sort of in a, in a uh, uh, what shall we call, somewhat of an understatement in their paper, they wrote that uh, the use of this, this has uh, potential for much wider use. And uh, so this, as far as uh, uh, I've seen, is really the first working camera phone system from 1994. Um, the first commercial one that you could sell uh, came out in 2000. It's on the bottom left, a, a sharp 
um, product with about 100,000 pixel sensor. And you could basically send images to another um, uh, person who had a similar camera phone. But within seven years, Apple came out with the iPhone um, somewhat late to the smartphone market, you might say, but you know, with the right uh, features at the right point and the right design. And um, in 2013, uh, this uh, quote from the Apple uh, iPhone website says, it's the world's most popular camera. And indeed, you know, smartphones have become the dominant design for mass market photography. So that's kind of where I wanted to, to leave you. Um, I do have uh, a slide with some questions uh, and uh, opportunity to ask questions, but also um, wanna, if you're looking for something to do with your smartphone, um, if you're in Rochester, you can download a, a, a tour blend app that I've developed with some friends. Um, it, it only works on the iPhone, but it will give you um, audio narrated guided walking tours around Rochester of the, the high falls or the lower falls. Um, if you want to learn a little bit about sustainability, there's an eco loop uh, tour. There's some a historic tour showing pictures taken 100 years ago by Albert Stone, who was uh, the photographer for the Rochester newspaper at the time. And one of the reasons I can get away with this plug is because this was actually built um, based off of uh, some software that was developed by a group uh, through the MIT incubator uh, led by um, Thomas Pounds. And what they developed was uh, a guide, um, it costs $5.99 to download, but it, it gives you tours of Boston, including of the MIT campus. They've got a nice hacking, uh, uh, hacking tour and the Freedom Trail and so on. So if you're looking for something to do with your smartphone in either location, uh, either download the free app uh, for Rochester or the paid app for, uh, for Boston. Very good. Uh, didn't want to interrupt you, Don. Yeah, uh, so at this point, uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead. Because yes, we have one came in from chat and I'm gonna ask Rob Stahl to uh, on mute and to ask it. Yeah, Ken, uh, that was that was fascinating, uh, and just the brilliance of all that. Uh, I was course six also, but uh, oh. <laughs> I think I think I know why I went into medicine because I couldn't <laughs> do any of what you do. Uh, so congratulations, I and mean, uh, just admirable and and brilliant. Uh, you know, I'm in awe. But uh, anyway. Uh, my question was, uh, when did uh, the people at Kodak uh, start to realize that digital photography was going to decimate their core business of uh, film-based photography? I mean, that's, I, I guess the right answer is it depends on the person, right? And uh, so some of us working on digital photography, you know, I think, I mean, that's part of why I came to Kodak, frankly. Um, I mean, I guess when I came to Kodak, I didn't appreciate what the profit margin was on film and how, uh, you know, how, how slim it was on, on digital technology. But I think, you know, some of us believed from the beginning that, uh, you know, that, that that was where things were headed. And, you know, Professor Schreiber actually encouraged me to go and work for Kodak. And he said, you know, they know all about color. Um, and we actually hired him in as a consultant to help look at uh, digital camera designs in the in the mid 80s. Um, so I think it was clear that just, you know, it was going to be a matter of time um, that, uh, that that digital photography was going to take over for, for photographic film. And it was really a question of, of what to do about it. Uh, we could have a whole session. Um, if you're looking for a topic for the future, maybe Bob to, to get a, a couple of uh, the Kodak retirees together to talk about what happened to Kodak and uh, and what what might have uh, what what maybe they should have done instead, um, but uh, but, but I, I think that to, to answer your question, I, you know, I think there were a lot of people, at least on the research side in the physics division where I started my career, that kind of saw that, you know, okay, in, we can have we can in the have the same conversation. I'm sorry. We had the same conversation with Xerox with respect to xerography and inkjet, but I won't go into that. Uh, uh, we've got a couple more questions, though. Uh, first, Lynn, uh, would you like to ask your question, or I can read it? 
Let, let's see if you can ask the question yourself, Bob. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Right, in terms of the optical system, so which is the optimized optical system for digital photography? Now, for example, for conventional photography in the past, you know, some people prefer to use single lens uh, reflex. Uh, some people like to have uh, the twin lens reflex camera. Now for digital photography, uh, how was the optical system uh, optimized? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, t I think practically speaking, you know, for professional cameras, the, the, in, in the 90s, there weren't enough digital cameras being sold that they basically had to design for the DSLR, for the SLR cameras that existed at the time. And then over time, um, the companies in those businesses have, have optimized lenses, you know, specifically for, um, uh, for image sensors. Um, I, would, I would say that the, you know, the, the, an SLR, um, body sing, single lens reflex camera has to have, you know, a room for a mirror with with uh, and so on, and and and, and a certain just dis back focus distance. And so, if you have a mirrorless camera, that's actually gives you much more freedom uh, in terms of the optical design. I'm an electrical engineer, not you know, not not really the expert on optics, but but I think by uh, by having mirrorless cameras, um, you're you're doing uh, you're doing better. Um, than, than sticking with SLR cameras. We, um, it was interesting in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, it was clear that sensors were becoming less and less expensive while, you know, glass wasn't. And so taking pictures with multiple sensors was something we looked at and filed some patents on it. Kodak actually came out with the first consumer digital cameras that had multiple um, lenses um, for, for different focal lengths. Unfortunately, we weren't very successful. We were probably, you know, 10 years ahead of the time. But the, the, there's a, you know, an interesting question now of, you know, how many lenses should you put on a smartphone? Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a two-piece question. One is um, a marketing question because um, just like more megapixel sells cameras, more lenses on the front of a smartphone um, some people will think is better, um, but but there actually is by taking multiple pictures and combining uh, the the images, you can come up with a better picture. Okay. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but um, that's sort of my thoughts on it at any rate. Yeah, well, well certainly. I mean, uh, uh, probably there are trade off between resolution versus sensitivity and and uh, size of the system and and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things with a smartphone, of course, you know, it's all about making a very thin product. So the thinness of the lens becomes really important. That's partly what drives you to use multiple lenses on the, you know, on the um, rear rear facing camera. Okay. Uh, Dave Ortman's got another question for you. Well, this time, uh, kind of more up your alley with electrical, it sounds like more, more of an electrical engineering image processing question. So Dave, go ahead. Yes, Ken. I'm interested in this, uh, the origin of this uh, EXIF uh, metadata format. How was that standard established? I mean, by what kind of body or organization? Uh, I'm into uh, geocaching myself, and uh, I see in a lot of different pieces of software that format seems broadly known and broadly compatible. It's apparently an open standard. How, can you tell us how that came about? Sure. So um, EXIF, which stands for Exchangeable Image Format, um, is actually standardized um, sort of in two ways. One is by um, a, a group in Japan. Um, so it's a, a Japanese standard, which we've contributed to in the U.S. And then um, it's part of the, I, I, I actually, in the U.S. chair of the group that develops ISO standards for photography. Um, and so we have a kind of an overlying standard that defines what metadata should be in a file, and we point to the standard made in Japan. Now, so that's how it's formally standardized. Um, and the, the group in Japan is called JCIA, Japan Camera Industries Association. And, and the, if, you, if you search for JCIA and EXIF, 
Um, I think you can download that for, for free. Um, the way it was actually standardized was Fujifilm was coming out with an early digital camera and they had been working with Kodak on APS, which is a, a kind of the last film format in the 90s uh, and, because that stored some metadata. Um, so they had developed some metadata. We were developing metadata as TIFF tags uh, that we used in our professional cameras. And um, it, it was interesting because even though Kodak at the time was suing Fuji in the World Trade Organization, um, we were meeting together to talk about how do we, uh, you know, this was at the engineer level, <laughs> we were meeting together to talk about how can we standardize metadata so that there's one, one standard rather than each company having their own. So, uh, so, so yeah, basically we agreed to things there. And then over the years it was expanded. The, uh, the, the uh, GPS tags were actually, um, came out of what was called Rich Tiff. And I brought them to this, you know, to uh, the um, people at Fujifilm that were involved and, and got them to be, got them to include GPS data as part of it. And over the years, there've been more and more metadata added to it. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Dave, is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, does anybody have any more questions uh, for Ken? Uh, if you do, on unmute your, unmute uh, your, I mute and ask them directly. I'll wait a second here, see whether anybody has anything. Hmm. Just yeah. a quick comment. Uh, I'm impressed by what seems to be sort of this persistent role that Kodak played in, in uh, moving the field forward. I really, never appreciated how important um, contributions were, you know, time after time sort of contributing to what, what you call the dominant design. It's a pretty great story. Thanks, yeah, you know, because this happened some decades ago, it's interesting that a lot of these cameras and, you know, are, are uh, you know, people kind of forget about it in, in part because a lot of this happened before everything was on the web. Um, but, you know, we did, you know, it, uh, people don't appreciate the fact that you know we did have some really good uh, early cameras and and actually had some some market success in the 90s and early 2000s um yeah. you know the the issue is of course this kind of um product is nowhere near as profitable as as photographic film became um oh, yeah. because of you know really because of the infrastructure kodak developed over the decades to uh, to to cope photographic film yeah That's I'll say that Kodak wasn't alone on that. Xerox had the same, uh, the same, um, um, I'll call it blind spot. Maybe you know, you think that they think that xerography was going to go on forever, and that uh, inkjet would never pass it, or that color uh, chemical film was going to go on forever. It's going to be a long time before digital passes it. You know, so companies make mistakes. You know, lots of companies. Plenty in Rochester. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. A uh, quick question. So when you first started off in this uh, profession, uh, did you think it would, we would be here today in, with all these technologies? Uh, no. Uh, I, I, what, one of the, what uh, may be an interesting sideline is that I started as a, I was the first 6A co-op at Motorola in 1978. And I went in and they showed me two different projects. One was uh, the system I worked on was to actually build a, a system that was going to go in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport in these little subway cars um, to, to to do the image, basically to transmit images and make sure someone wasn't getting mugged on the little subway car. And then the second thing was that they were building the um, basically the the switching system for a Baltimore-Washington test of something called cellular telephones. And so that was a the second thing I could have worked on, and I picked the first one because I figured, well, okay, I can tell whether the image is working or being transmitted. You know, it's easy to see whether it's working or not. I don't know how the cellular stuff, you know, what what what, what you really do there. But I always wondered if I would have picked the second one, you know, what would have happened to my career. Um, but like I say, it wasn't surprising to me that, um, you know, that digital digital imaging took over for film-based photography. But kind of how it did it and, and when it did it was was interesting because it was actually pretty slow initially, um, and then between 2002 and 2005, 
um, film, which had been projected to decrease by 10% over the next six years, you know, decreased by 80% over the next three or four years. And so it just, once, once the quality got there at the right price point, it's amazing how, how much the industry uh, changed and how quickly it was. And as Bob was saying, you know, at that point, it's too, it's too late for a company to really react um, and, and do something yeah. different. So that, you know, certainly surprised by some of the technologies um, that came about, but I think, you know, it, it wasn't that surprising that digital photography took over for, for photographic film. But, you know, film is still, still has life. There, there's an amazing number of um, uh, X-ray film that's still sold today by uh, CareStream, which is in Kodak's old uh, imaging, medical imaging division in Rochester. So there's still, and, and some people are still shooting movies on film and, and uh, you know, it's kind of like the, the kids who are taking vinyl records or buying vinyl records are also taking pictures on film because it's the interesting thing to do. Yeah, it's interesting to see how technology has moved over our lifetimes, very much so. Okay, is yeah. there any other questions? I think that the time is this is just about perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, Ken, what do you see five to 10 years from now in terms of personal uh, imaging photography, uh, uh, VR, virtual reality, holographic, uh, I mean, what, what's coming down the pipe? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. The, the thing that I really get interested in is uh, I've been playing with drone photography the last year or so. And it's, you know, it's amazing what you can buy in a $600 drone, uh, you know, how good the quality is, um, both for video, you know, stabilized video and everything. And I was, I was to wonder if that's the, you know, one of the ways, it's what, what's cool about a drone is you can see the world from a totally different perspective, you know, and they're still kind of, you know, battery hungry and noisy and all, but it, it seems to me like, you, you know, if your main goal was to take pictures, you know, as the, as the camera part gets smaller and, and lighter, you could make some really tiny drones and, you know, fly them around and, you know, be, be in the picture, which is, uh, you know, which is something that you really couldn't do very easily until they started putting, you know, the FaceTime cameras on, on smartphones. Um, so I, I kind of like that. I played around a little bit with VR um, and maybe I'm just too old for it, but I haven't, you know, I haven't quite seen a really interesting VR movie yet. Um, so I, I think it would be tough to make one personally, um, but you know, people who are a couple generations younger than me may, you know, pick that up and run, run with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, one more question, I think, if there are any. We have all of them out. Okay. Ken, thank you very, very much. I thought that was an excellent presentation. I, I learned a lot. And uh, we recorded the whole thing, so it'll be on, uh, uh, at least the link to it will be uh, hopefully posted to our, uh, uh, to our website very soon. And uh, look for the next, uh, first, thank you very much. And I don't know, too many, you can't, we can't, no audience to applaud, but that's <laughs> probably the best you can get. Well, thanks, really, thanks so much, thank everyone. Much. For, uh, Thanks everyone for tuning in. I, I and enjoyed. look for the announcement from uh, Rob for uh, from the Club of, w of Western New York for uh, the next uh, con next uh, talk on uh, Netflix streaming uh, content. And I'm sure that's going to be uh, equally uh, uh, interesting. And I think that we're doing a really great job of putting together an interesting seminar seminar series. And uh, this is a very important part of it. So thanks very much, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Else, uh, Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, I know. Everybody on, everybody on mute and clap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. You. Yep, bye thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.